Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today, hosted by Coach University Graduate School of Health Sciences. Thank you, everyone, who st has started to join our session. Um, I guess we will receive more people as we go on. If you have missed any part of the presentation, do not worry, because we will be posting the recording of this webinar to our YouTube video, and you will also receive it as a link by email um, after today. So thank you everyone for joining. I just want to start letting you know who is speaking today. My name is Melissa Abad, I'm the Global um, Recruitment Team Manager. So our team is responsible for providing information and guidance to international applicants to Coach University's undergraduate and graduate programs. So I'm very happy to be hosting this webinar where we will be talking to the director of our Graduate School of Health Sciences, Professor Yasemin um, Bursoy Ozemir. So I will briefly unmute Professor, uh, I think she's unmuted, um, Professor Yasemin, so that she can briefly introduce herself to the group. Hello everyone. Uh, it is very nice that we are uh, together today to discuss and uh, talk about our programs of the Graduate School of Health Sciences. I am a neurologist and a neuroscientist and uh, I am working on the neuroscience subjects but uh, actually I am the director of the uh, School of Health Science, Graduate School of Health Sciences uh, from the uh, 2016 uh, actually, our uh, graduate school of health sciences is a very uh, new graduate school at the Koch University, but uh, we are uh, getting uh, new programs and uh, we are re recruiting uh, good students. So I will just want to say hello to you and then Melissa, maybe you can continue. Yes, thank you very much for your introduction, uh, Professor Yasemin. So yes, uh, we're going to follow this, the, the structure that I will show you now. We're gonna do a very quick overview of Coach University for those of you who are not familiar with the university. Um, we will also talk very briefly about our rankings um, at, in general and in terms of our health programs. Then uh, we'll talk about some specific memberships of our graduate school health, of health sciences. We will present the programs that we offer at master and PhD level. We will look at the laboratories that are available for graduate students um, when they join the graduate school. Uh, we will give you also a brief overview of uh, who are our students, both national in terms of Turkey and international students, where are our alumni located now after from the um, PhD and master programs. Then we will go into more detail about the requirements for admission to our master and PhD programs. Also in our panelists today, we have the program coordinators for, for the School of uh, Health Sciences, uh, Ms. Eja and Ms. Simai. So she, they will also be able to answer specific questions you may have at the end of the webinar. So if you have, if you have a specific question about your individual situation, we would actually advise you to write to us. But if it's something a bit more general, we will do our best to answer today. Of course, um, we have some updates regarding the admission process to be followed this year in light of restrictions and test cancellations because of coronavirus. Um, uh, you know, the, the pandemic that is happening and affecting all of us. So we will um, let you know about that. Then we will talk about financial aid um, and scholarships that we offer to graduate students and also about the tuition for our paid master programs. And then we will have time for um, question and answers from you. Please remember that you can type your questions on the chat window that you can see on your screens. You can, um, what I would kindly ask you is to uh, keep in mind those questions. And once we start the Q&A to type them there and we will go um, through them one by one if we have not answered them already during the webinar. So um, I think we have a very mixed group today of participants from different countries, but also from Turkey. So for those of you who are new to Turkey, you have never been to Istanbul, I just want to say that um, our, our campus as a university 
is located in the city of Istanbul, which is a very big city, it's 15 million people, and it's, it's divided in two continents, so Asia and Europe. We are located on the European side of the city, towards the northwest. Um, the picture that you see on the left, that's our main campus, uh, located in the Rumeli Feneri area. So it's a very beautiful um, campus that has everything you need, and that's where you would see some of the courses as a master or PhD student. Uh, very few. But then our biggest asset really is our Koch University Hospital, which are the pictures that you see on the right hand side of the slide. So the, the, the hospital, it's a fully fledged research and teaching hospital with all the facilities you will need. We will see in more detailed list of laboratories that are available. And it's located closer to, let, let's say, the downtown area of Istanbul and it's very easily accessible via public transport or car, um, and it has all the facilities that you need there as well. So to give you a quick overview of us as a, as a university in general, um, Coach University was founded 25 years ago. We're actually now in our 26th year. We celebrated our anniversary last year, and we were set up to become a center of excellence that would provide world-class education that would also create new knowledge for the benefit of society. So in that short time, I think uh, we can all agree, and if you ask anyone in Turkey, we are achieving um, that and more. So despite being a small university, when you look at our student size, we have approximately 7,000 students with close now to 500 faculty members across all of our colleges and graduate schools. You will see that we have been able to achieve quite a lot, especially when it comes to research. And when, you, when we start to look in more detail at the Graduate School of Health Sciences, you will understand why. Um, we are very similar in terms of structure to an American university, even though we're located in Turkey, in that um, the type of undergraduate programs that we offer, master and PhDs are structured in a very similar way to the best universities in the US. We also offer a lot of opportunities for both undergraduate and graduate students to conduct um, collaboration with other universities, whether as an exchange student taking courses or also doing individual research. Research, as you will see, is a key word here. So we are a research intensive university and our goal is not to contribute only um, to the creation of knowledge that it's relevant to Turkey, but on a global scale. Um, and just before we started the, the webinar, I was surprised to hear from Professor Yasemin that between our faculty members, there's around 40 active projects right now that are um, uh, relevant to solving different aspects of the coronavirus pandemic. So in a very short time, our university has been able to start contributing to um, the short and medium term solutions for this global issue. So that's, that's the spirit that animates everything we do. The quality of that research is reflected in different ways. One is, for example, we are now the top national, um, the top recipient of national research awards, which are awarded by the Turkish, um, count, like the Turkish National Scientific Council, TÜBİTAK. We're also one of, or actually now the highest recipient of European Research Council grants in Turkey. These are extremely competitive grants that all European researchers have to apply for as individuals. So we now hold the highest number of these grants in Turkey. And um, another thing that distinguishes us as a university is our strong relations with industry in quite a diverse set of uh, industries which also inform the practice that we have in classrooms and the type of applied research and development projects that we're able to conduct across all areas, including um, health sciences. And finally, rankings I know are important for some prospective applicants when they're considering their choices of universities to apply for graduate studies. In that regard, uh, we're doing quite well as a young university in that we uh, were ranked first in, in Turkey in 2019 by the QS World University Rankings and um, Times Higher Education, which is another well-respected rankings um, system, also placed us in the top 600 universities worldwide for the subject of clinical, preclinical, and health sciences. That's quite an achievement, again, taking into consideration how young we are as a university, how young our School of Medicine and our Graduate School of Health Sciences is, and the, the number of faculty members that we have 
at the university that are conducting research. So I just wanted to um, show you that. And of course, you can see more details about that in relevant websites. Now I'm going to pass back the microphone to Professor Yasemin. Um, just to talk a little bit about this specific membership, which is quite important for our graduate school of health sciences in terms of PhD education. Uh, thank you very much, Melissa. Um, actually, uh, we just want to make sure that we are giving the best PhD training uh, in our university. Uh, so we be uh, became a member of the Orpheus, maybe you have heard previously, but it's a uh, European-based uh, organization for the regulation of the PhD education in biomedicine and health sciences. So the main aim of this uh, program is uh, to uh, define the uh, best practice within a PhD training program. And uh, so we are an institutional member of the Orpheus and we just want to get the label and uh, maybe in the future, especially in the Europe and the uh, US, uh, the uh, label will be important for uh, the applications for the becoming a faculty member or taking some jobs. Um, so we are a member of the Orpheus. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, Melissa. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, uh, Professor Yasemin, do you want to talk about now the... Yeah, okay. I can just uh, talk about our programs. Uh, so now you can see that we uh, offer several uh, master and PhD programs. And in master programs, we have thesis and non-thesis programs. Actually, for the thesis programs, we usually uh, want to, uh, students uh, to attend as a full-time to the program. And in Nantes is, is a kind of uh, just for the lectures and the, uh, some uh, kind of uh, paper preparation uh, for the final exam. Uh, but we have uh, neuroscience, uh, both master and the PhD program, and they are thesis programs, cellular and molecular medicine, similarly thesis program for master and the PhD program. We have immunology, both non-thesis, thesis, and the PhD program. We have reproductive uh, biology master and the reproductive medicine PhD programs. We have nursing program, and uh, but this nursing program is uh, the official language is not English for the other programs. The official language is the uh, English. Uh, for nursing, it is Turkish. Um, for we are also. Uh, we have a programs, uh, a joint programs with the Graduate School of Science and Engineering, uh, like Molecular Biology and Genetics, uh, Biomedical Sciences and Engineering. And also we have Medical Physiology and Medical Microbiology uh, master programs. They are also thesis uh, master programs. And we can pass to the other slide, Melissa. Okay, so um, uh, as I said, we have the immunology non thesis program, and uh, the other programs are with thesis. Maybe, uh, Melissa, you can continue. I can close. Sure. Yeah, so um, just to give you an overview of the system in uh, Turkey. So uh, when we say non thesis, it's usually composed of courses with a final project. In our university, the tuition for this uh, type of master's is approximately $19,000. We are expressing the tuition in dollars because in Turkish Lira, um, the tuition for the next academic year has not been announced yet. So this is the equivalent in um, US dollars. So that, um, for example, uh, our immunology is a master non-thesis that can be taken in that way. Then we have master with thesis, okay, sorry, and the duration of those master non-thesis programs is usually um, two semesters or one year. Then we have master with thesis programs, which are um, two years, typically can be extended a bit depending on the, the thesis, you know, work that you need to do. 
So for all master with thesis programs, except for neuroscience and cellular molecular medicine, we offer all admitted candidates a full tuition waiver, or you can understand that as a 100% um, tuition scholarship. In addition to that, depending on funding, then we're also able to uh, provide a monthly stipend to cover living expenses, um, housing either near campus in our graduate apartments or a housing allowance, again, depending on the funding available and the pool of applicants that is accepted each year. And there are some other benefits. We will see the full list of benefits in a few more slides when we talk about financial aid and scholarships. Then lastly, we have our PhD programs, which um, as I was mentioning, because we're structured very similarly to a, as an American university, our PhD structure is um, typically four years, which again can be extended if there's more, you know, if there is need for more time for the thesis or the dissertation writing and the research. Um, and we offer all admitted students, national or international, a full tuition waiver for the duration of the program for the four years. Okay, this means 100% tuition scholarship. There's also a monthly stipend, housing or housing aid, health insurance, and other benefits. It is very competitive in terms of admission, and we will explain what are the requirements. But this is, you know, this is um, the kind of overview that we would like to give in terms of health um, length. Sorry and um, tuition scholarships that we offer. We receive sometimes questions whether students can enroll in our PhD programs by paying tuition if they're employer or they've had their, their own funding to do this. And it is possible, it's not common, but it is possible. So if you're interested in this option, you can also contact us later, but of course you need to um, you know, uh, comply or have all the other admission requirements um, needed for the graduate school. very exciting part of our webinar um, and I will go back now to Professor Yasemin to tell us a little bit about the laboratory um, and research facilities that are available to graduate students um, in the Graduate School of Health Sciences. As a Graduate School of Health Sciences, uh, since we are located at both main campus and the hospital, we have a lot of uh, laboratory facilities for example, we have a microbiology laboratory located at the hospital with a BCL3 facility that allows us to study, for example, the virus like the coronavirus. So now uh, with this facility and the other uh, laboratory opportunities, more than 40 uh, projects are on the way uh, to define the uh, new uh, diagnostic tools, treatment targets uh, for the coronavirus, for example. So it's a very brand new and a, a very uh, complex laboratory. We have uh, genomic uh, laboratories. Actually, we have uh, one uh, facility giving mostly the uh, clinical genomic uh, studies and one uh, doing the uh, mostly uh, uh, genomic uh, gene level uh, studies uh, for the research uh, facility for the research purposes. And they are both located at the main hospital. And we have the proteomics laboratories uh, that we have all the necessary equipments and the uh, uh, computers for the proteomics and they are located at the main campus. Uh, we have stem cell and gene transplant laboratories located at the main campus and our physiology department is really, really very uh, much involved in the hemorrheology. Actually, it's a kind of blood uh, flow and the blood dynamic regulation. So they have a very good laboratory uh, and they are working together with the mostly engineering uh, faculty to develop some uh, translational devices that can be used in the patients. And also we have a neurophysiology laboratory at the main campus uh, dealing with the EEG, ERP, and uh, other kind of neurophysiological recordings. And it, this is just for the research purposes. At the hospital also we have at the neurology department and also uh, as a research facility we have 
neurophysiological recording uh, equipments and the laboratory space. And also we have, I have to deal that I actually for the, this microbiology laboratory with the BCL3, uh, it is one of the uh, most important uh, part. And I have to mention that uh, because in Turkey or around the uh, world, uh, it is difficult to find a facility uh, doing the research and also having the BCL3. So it is one of the most important things. And also we have very brand new, very cutting edge microscopy laboratory uh, at the uh, both uh, campus, uh, main campus and the hospital. Uh, we have uh, the uh, confocal microscope, multiphoton microscopy, uh, electron microscopy and light sheet microscopy. Um, in addition, uh, stat, we have also STAT microscopy. So it is actually uh, difficult in the, both Europe and Turkey uh, to find a microscopy facility that uh, all these kind of cutting edge technologies. Um, so we are proud about, uh, proud uh, of our microscopy laboratory. We have anatomy laboratory, mostly uh, working together with the medical uh, students. And also we have uh, a lot of dry and wet uh, laboratories for the uh, routine, like Western bloods, PCRs, and doing immunohistochemistry and the other stuff. Um, so if you can see, we have the old, uh, different kinds of laboratories covering nearly all life sciences areas. And we can pass to the other slide, I think. So I have to mention also that these laboratories, uh, most of them are uh, a part of the Koch University Translational Medicine Research Center, Kutlam. This is, um, a research facility that government uh, funds and it is actually for the Turkey, it's one of the highest uh, uh, cutting edge uh, technology containing and the government uh, funded with the highest amount. Uh, so it is like uh, you can get all uh, necessary equipments and actually the Kutlam is located both in the uh, hospital and also um, the main campus. Uh, where, and we just uh, trying to do the cutting edge research uh, and we can give the numbers like uh, if we combine both uh, campuses areas, it is more than uh, 6,000 uh, uh, square meters. So we have uh, PhD students and the postgraduate uh, students at this research facility. And uh, some of them are our uh, graduate school of health sciences students. And some of them are the uh, students of the uh, graduate school of uh, science and engineering. And um, they are also working uh, in this uh, Kuttam uh, research center. Uh, because this research center provides multidisciplinary approach to different uh, disease uh, models and it just provides, actually the main aim is to provide uh, translational research. So from bench site to the bed site, also from bed site, if you have an idea, you can go to the um, bench and try to find new solutions. So you can see that eight laboratories are located here, like molecular medicine laboratory containing all Western blood, PCR and the other stuff, cellular and molecular imaging laboratory containing the microscopies that I have uh, described, omics laboratory for the proteomics studies. And we have at the hospital motion analysis and cognition laboratory uh, for the clinical uh, research studies. And we have animal research facility. Actually, it is also uh, newly renovated, uh, very good animal research facility. So we have transgenic animals and we have uh, incubation areas and we have all the necessary 
research and the uh, behavioral follow-up equipments located in this animal research facility. Uh, there are neurodegeneration research laboratories, so I am a part of that. And also we have several other neuroscientists working on this uh, laboratory. And uh, biomechanics and endurance laboratory mainly uh, works uh, with the uh, engineering department and nanoscale prototype laboratory also. Uh, it's a kindly uh, involvement of the uh, science, engineering and the health sciences together. So we can just, uh, for example, from health sciences aspect, we are working on the uh, nanoparticle uh, targeted drug delivery strategies, but also engineering part working on the chips and the small devices that may help to the uh, translational research uh, for the medicine. Uh, okay, I think. Uh, and uh, as you can see, now we have 92 PhD students in our programs. This is just the Graduate School of Health Sciences number of students. And we have 57 master's students and uh, most of the master uh, students actually are on the nursing program because our master programs are very new. So we will, uh, for example, for the neuroscience and cellular molecular medicine, this is the first year that we will recruit master students. Um, so these are the numbers. And uh, also you can see we have both um, international and the national students. Uh, you can see that uh, we have uh, a limited number of the international students, but we are uh, happy to increase this number. Uh, so um, uh, we want to be, uh, actually we, our programs are uh, mostly in English and we are uh, welcoming the international students. Uh, but uh, since we have established as a graduate school of health sciences at uh, 2011, and the, our, our programs are uh, developed uh, until last years. So we are just trying to recruit uh, the international students. Melissa, maybe you may want to say something about that. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Uh, yes, I mean, so uh, just to go back to that, Coach University is actively looking for talented international students from different countries. So you will see that the admission requirements when we get to that part, they are exactly the same both for domestic or national students as well as for international students. But we do have specific support that can be provided for international students because you're moving to a different country and you have a different set of needs. So in that regard, um, we have an international community office which is responsible for organizing, for example, the welcome orientation for international graduate students every year. And they are the first point of contact in terms of providing support for visa application, for um, obtaining your student residence permit, health insurance in Turkey, um, help with accommodation if you wish to, to use private, uh, privately rented accommodation. And then, you know, basically helping you to guide your first year as you transition to to a new country. We do receive a lot of ap applications from specific countries near Turkey, for example, from Pakistan, from Iran, um, Azerbaijan, and then from the wider Middle East, North Africa region. So uh, we're also, our office um, is able to visit those countries. You know, before all of this happened, we were actively traveling there regularly to, again, visit some of our partner universities and also to uh, participate in different educational fairs. Right now, of course, that's not possible, but I would, um, if you're joining and you're an international prospective applicant, I would highly um, encourage you to, to get in touch with us after the webinar if you have specific questions as an international student. Hopefully we will cover all of those questions today, but if you have something specific, you can also let us know. And I think now we're in a very exciting slide, which is a, the slide talking about our alumni from, from the graduate school. Professor. Just looking at the story for 
interruptions. So we have actually, uh, although we are a very uh, new uh, school, uh, we have actually uh, graduated uh, students and uh, actually we are proud that our um, graduation, graduated students find uh, good places internationally. So from here you can see that some of our uh, PhD students and the master uh, graduated students, they go, uh, as you can see, very good universities and the very good places. Uh, so we are uh, providing a really very good education and the research uh, abilities. So they can easily find uh, a place after their graduation. Okay, these are our requirements for the applications. Uh, Melissa or Jessima, yeah. yeah. who wants to continue? I will give a summary and then um, I, will, um, I will ask you if you have specific questions after this to write them on the chat section, okay? So the, as I said, uh, Coach University, including the Graduate School of Health Sciences, um, uses a, a selective and holistic approach to admissions uh, for graduate programs, especially for PhD programs. So holistic means that everything that you see on the slide right now is taken into consideration in terms of making a decision of whether to admit, reject, or conditionally admit a student to a specific program. So when we go one by one through those requirements, the first one we see there is your resume or CV. Um, if you're more familiar with the North American term, then it's, it's a resume, resume, if not it's, it's a CV. The main purpose of that is to have a look at a summary of you as a candidate, where you can talk about your previous education, if you have research experience and talk about any publications or posters or contributions that you have done in research, which of course are very important for graduate programs. Then we have a very important element of the application, which is the statement of purpose. The statement of purpose, um, the idea is that you uh, present yourself to the program faculty members who will be evaluating your application and you will explain how you fit, how your, your experience, skills and knowledge fit with the program. And specifically, how your research interests, whether that's at master level or at PhD level, are aligned with the research interest of the faculty members in the specific program, let's say in cellular molecular medicine or in neuroscience or in immunology. The idea for them is to see whether there would be availability of supervision based on what topics you're interested in um, and also to see if your background in terms of your undergraduate or, or master's degree, your experience so far, specific lab or technical skills that you would uh, bring with you would add value to the program as a PhD student or as a master's student. So that is a, an element of the application that we always ask applicants to take enough time to prepare, to make sure that you have other people read it before you send it, to make sure that there's no typos, that there's no grammar errors, that you are addressing it to the right <laughs> university because this also happens sometimes. And we have put um, very detailed guidance on how to prepare that statement of purpose on our website there's even examples for different disciplines that you can see for guidance and there's a lot of free online resources that you can also check in terms of how to write the a statement of purpose it's important there to show that you have done a bit of research about our university and about the program and the faculty members and for example just attending this webinar is a good indication of that that hopefully gives you an idea of um, the the profile of candidates that we're looking for. And then you can see for each faculty member, the projects that they're working in, their recent, recent publications, um, recent conference presentations, and that gives you an idea of whether, you know, you would fit with the, with the group that they're um, leading or with the lab that they're heading. Then we have recommendation letters. These are, um, there are a minimum needed of two for the master programs and three for the PhD programs. You do not upload the recommendation letter directly to the system, to the online application form, but you are asked to write down the contact details, meaning the, the name, email address, and position of the um, people who will be your referees. These are usually academic uh, referees. So 
professors that have taught you or supervised you in your previous degree. But if, for example, you have been um, out of, of formal education for a while and you're not able to receive recommendations from academicians, you know, from researchers, let's say, but you're able to obtain them from professional referees if you have been working in a laboratory environment or, or somewhere else, then those are okay. But of course, the preference is to, to have at least um, one of these referees to be academic. Then um, we have your transcripts uh, from all the universities uh, where you have completed a degree. If you have not completed your degree, for example, if you're in the last year of your undergraduate degree and you're applying for a master's program, that's okay. It should just show um, all of your courses completed until now and your um, grade point average until now. There are some rules which are set by the Turkish Higher Education Council in terms of the minimum grade point average which is needed to enter into a PhD program and a master's program that you can see there. So um, the idea is that if your university system or your national education system is not graded on a scale of four, there's also equivalencies that you can find on a scale of 100 or a scale of 20 to then calculate if you're meeting the minimum required. Then on the right hand side, we have um, two required test scores, okay? One is with regards to English proficiency because our programs, as Professor Yasemin mentioned, are all taught in English with the exception of uh, nursing. So in the English proficiency, requirement you should provide either a TOEFL internet-based test with a minimum score of 80 or if you're um, in Turkey or a, a Turkish candidate you can also take the YDS or Yokdil exam. We know that there's limitations right now in terms of taking these exams and we will talk about how we're approaching this in the next slide. The same applies for the next item which is graduate proficiency um, test scores. So Again, all applicants, Turkish and international, should provide one of this. So either the GRE, okay, um, and the you can see minimum required in the quantitative um, analysis section. There's other sections to the test, but usually what the faculty members will be checking in terms of eligibility is your quantitative, quantitative analysis skills. And then for Turkish applicants, there is the ALIS exam that you might be familiar with that has also been um, postponed for this year but there's no worry i mean like you can still apply without that and you can see the minimum requirements there one question that we get asked very often is about the ielts or ielts exam exam english exam um, unfortunately that exam is not currently accepted by the turkish higher education council for admission or for enrollment at Turkish universities. If you have taken it already and you have um, a minimum, you know, a score above 6.5, you can attach that to your application as an extra document. But you will, if you're offered admission to any of the master or PhD programs, you would still need to provide either a TOEFL internet, internet based test or others. The only um, candidates who are able to be exempt from the English proficiency requirement are those that have um, that have citizenship from English native speaking countries. And there is a specific list that the Turkish Higher Education Council uses for that, or that you have completed all of your education in an English native speaking country. And there's also a list for that, okay? Um, we are aware that both the TOEFL test and the GRE test is not currently available but um, fortunately ETS, which is a company that um, administers the test, has announced very recently, I think in the past two weeks, that they're able to now offer the test online that you can take at home. So you will be able to see instructions on the official website on how to register for the at-home test and whether you meet these space kind of requirements that they have to take the test at home. That would be a recommendation. To, to register for that option as soon as possible, if you can, and if it's available in your country. The information that they provided, it's, a, it's available in all countries with the exception of China and Iran. 
uh, and they're working on that as well to, to solve that easily. But um, as of now, in every other country, you should be able to take both tests online at home, okay? So last thing to mention here, I'm sorry, I have been talking <laughs> for a while now, but all the application process is done online. So we do not receive any documents via email or you don't need to send any original documents, um, you know, via post or, you know, courier services or anything like that. Uh, we take all applications through our online application system and you can see it on the red box in the slide, which is apply.ku.edu.tr. You will see there, there is a section for graduate programs and then you find the uh, Graduate School of Health Sciences and then you will see all the programs that are currently open for application. Uh, we do have um, specific intakes. So the Graduate School of Health Sciences usually has a, the a main intake of students. It's for the fall semester. For us, the fall semester is September every year. And each year, it, depending on whether there's funding available and spaces, let's say, that they may also open some programs for spring admission. Spring meaning February start. So you will see all of the deadlines for each intake on the Graduate School of Health Sciences website. For PhD programs, um, they, they sort of remain open on the system throughout the year, so it kind of works on a, on a rolling basis, and, I, and perhaps later on um, our colleagues, Edie and Simai, can, can explain this in more detail, but the idea is that um, if we see, you know, if there are very good candidates, they can be contacted for, for an interview throughout the year, of course, the preference is to do it during the, the normal application periods. Um, and if you're offered admission, then you're offered admission for the next intake, which in our case right now is for the fall 2020 semester. Okay. Um, I see some of you are joining now um, and asking if there will be a full recording of this meeting. Just to answer very quickly, the answer is yes. Um, to all, all the participants who have registered for the webinar, We'll get an automatic message tomorrow with the link where they can see the recording of the of the video okay going to move on now so um, we know that this is in front of everyone's minds right now for those of you who want to start your graduate studies this year in the fall as i said um, now that there are online at home test options for the GRE and the TOEFL, our recommendation is to register to take those tests. If you're not able to take it before our application deadline, that's okay, but you should indicate on the online application form that you have registered to take them. There is a section for test scores and there you would select GRE and the date that you have registered to take it. And once you receive the scores, you can upload them to the application form. Um, and also you can email them to the graduate school. Um, without this, you, I mean, you will still be evaluated with all the other application documents that I mentioned before, which are the statement of purpose, recommendation letters, transcripts, CV, if you have any publications, so that you can be evaluated as a candidate. So the program faculty members, they have a, you know, an evaluation committee. They will look at all the applicants on the system and make a short list that they want to interview. Those interviews um, can happen in person if, they are, if you are here in, in Istanbul, in, in Turkey, but of course, even now under the current circumstances, I think all of them will be done online via Zoom or Skype. Um, and then after that, then usually uh, the graduate school is able to offer either a full acceptance or a conditional uh, acceptance or a rejection, okay? So we might find that this year, they may issue conditional admissions for selected candidates. What conditional admissions will mean in this sense is that if what's missing in your application is a GRE or TOEFL test, they will still be a, you will still be able to enroll as a student, but you, are, you have to commit to provide the GRE and the TOEFL test score, um, you know, either during the first uh, week when you're enrolling as a student or during the first semester. So we understand the barriers that both Turkish and international candidates have right now 
to, to comply with all the requirements. Um, and we're offering flexibility so that you can still be evaluated on the basis of the other elements of your, your application, okay? Right, so, um, so again, our website, uh, both the Graduate School of Health Sciences website, which you can see there, it's gshs.ku.edu.tr, has a lot of information about, of course, each program in terms of the curriculum, the faculty members, the research, and also our international admissions website has a lot of guidance in terms of, as I said, how to prepare the statement of purpose. If you want to contact, for example, one of the faculty members, we have some guidance on how to do that in a proper way so that you're more likely to get a response. How to, pre how to ask for recommendation letters, um, how to register for the GRE and the TOEFL um, test score. So we have put a lot of guidance there that will be useful as you are preparing your your application and we strongly advise you to check that before you submit the application okay because after you have submitted the application it's a bit too late and you cannot make changes for example to the statement of purpose or if you want to change referees for example it can be done but it's a bit um, time consuming and may hurt your evaluation uh, process so this is why we strongly uh, urge you to read that guidance before you submit the application okay Okay, so um, going back to the topic of scholarships, which I know it's, it's also very important to um, a lot of you here. So we have um, two types of scholarships. I will talk first about the Koch University Graduate Scholarship and then I'll give back the microphone to Professor Yasemin to talk about the project-based um, scholarship. So, KU Graduate Scholarship means that they are funded by Koch University from its central budget. We're quite unique in Turkey in, the, in terms of the number of PhD students that we are centrally funded. Um, and that gives you an indication, as I said, of how important research is to, to us as, a, as an institution. So for PhD students who are admitted to any of, of the programs that we saw before, all of them, national or international, they're all offer 100% tuition waiver or exemption, meaning you do not pay any tuition fees for the duration of the program. Then you also receive a monthly stipend or salary to cover your living expenses. The amount of that stipend in Turkish Lira, for example, we have a, a baseline of 2000 Turkish Lira. That amount increases after you take the PhD qualifier exam. The PhD qualifier exam is usually after you have completed your um, courses within the first two or three semesters. If you successfully pass that exam, then that stipend increases. Then um, we also provide to all admitted candidates free furnished shared housing near campus or if you prefer, because you have specific family situation or you already are living in Istanbul, to receive a housing allowance or aid, then we can provide that as well. The amounts will, you know, they're currently, you can see them on the Graduate School of Health Sciences. Um, they may be revised each year. And again, it's a housing aid. It's not aimed to cover all of your housing costs, but to support or, or cover part of them, okay? and. We also offer private health insurance with limited coverage for all of our um, graduate students. Um, meal card, if you have a car when we have some, uh, you know, like parking uh, subsidies, let's say. And this is very important. For example, if you um, have uh, been accepted for a conference with one of your papers that you have written, with your group or with your supervisor, then we can provide travel support to attend scientific events. Um, in the details of this and how it works, that's where um, AJ and Simai can also tell us. And then um, for the master with thesis scholarships, again, it works as a 100% tuition waiver. So no fees for the duration of the master with thesis. There is a monthly stipend, housing aid, private health insurance and travel support. Again, the benefits beside the tuition waiver can be awarded on a competitive basis based on the amount of available central funding the university gives every year. And what we were mentioning before is, for example, for our masters with thesis in immunology, we do charge 
tuition, but there will be a limited number of scholarships that can be awarded to the best candidates each year, for example, for fall 2020. So if you are an outstanding student academically in terms of your, you know, background and, and GPA and grades and research experience, then um, of course you will be considered for one of these scholarships. Now, um, I'm going to, okay, so I want to like Professor Yasemin to tell us a little bit about the project-based graduate scholarships. Okay, thank you very much, Melissa. Actually, for the project-based uh, scholarships, um, the, the, our faculty members, um, they apply for the grants uh, either to TÜBİTAK in Turkey, it's like NIH of Turkey, and uh, to European grants and uh, maybe uh, all over the world, there are some uh, new grants, uh, like for, for example, now the COVID-19 grants are popular. And so they apply and from there they uh, just uh, can get uh, the monthly stipends for the master or the uh, PhD students. So they are actually uh, amount of the stipend depends on the uh, grant. For example, for the TÜBİTAK, it is for in Turkish liras, uh, 3,500 Turkish liras per month for the PhD students. So uh, it depends on uh, the amount of the uh, gr grant. And if, for example, if it is European kind grant, you can get more, uh, much more uh, uh, uh, salaries depending on the project. Um, since your uh, advisor or the faculty, our faculty member, and uh, actually uh, he or she will be your advisor, uh, since he or she provides the monthly stipend, so as a uh, graduate school of health sciences, we provide some financial aid and side benefits, like the again 100% tuition waiver, and uh, sometimes for the PhD students, we provide if it is possible uh, housing near the campus or near the hospital. Uh, for the master students, we uh, support the housing uh, aid, uh, we just give some money for uh, providing by himself or herself a housing and uh, private health insurance, meal card. And for the, uh, if you have a car, car sticker, actually free uh, car sticker for the entrance to the campus or, and also hospital. And also we, uh, as Melissa said, we provide travel support to attend scientific events. Actually, it depends on uh, the scientific events location also. Each year we provide each uh, student if they have oral uh, presentation. Uh, for example, in Europe, the amount differs if you are presenting at USA or the other uh, uh, distant countries, then we provide a little bit uh, higher uh, travel uh, support. Actually, this travel support like covers the flight and the hotel and the admission uh, to the conference. So I think, is it? Okay. Uh, did I miss something? Yeah. Um, we're going to talk now briefly about two separate um, additional, let's say, scholarship opportunities that we have. One is more geared towards Turkish, like domestic applicants through TUBITAK, which is a national science council called TUBITAK BIDET, BIDET, uh, sorry, BIDET scholarship. Um, and the other one is for international candidates, which is the Turkish, uh, Turkish scholarship, doctoral scholarship. So um, if you want to talk about the BIDET, TUBITAK BIDET scholarship, uh, Professor Yasemin. First. Okay, to be talk, BDEB scholarship is a kind of domestic for the Turkish students and uh, they uh, provide monthly stipends. And uh, since uh, you got this scholarship, uh, we provide some uh, reward uh, since you are getting the scholarship from TÜBİTAK. So monthly uh, around like 700 Turkish liras we add on top of it. 
uh, and all the uh, graduate schools uh, do the same thing. And uh, actually that's why we just want from all the Turkish students to apply to the TÜBİTAK BİDAP uh, scholarship. So you can get better uh, scholarship compared to the uh, Koç Üniversitesi scholarship if you apply to the BİDAP. Okay. And for the Turkish uh, scholarships, maybe Melissa, you will okay. want to uh -huh, talk. Perfect. So the Turkish doctor, the Turkish scholarship, doctoral scholarship, it's a very long name. Um, it's a scholarship program which is funded by the Turkish government, not by, Tur not by Koç University. This is um, for any student in any country. So all countries are eligible if you're applying for a PhD program. The only, or let's say the main eligibility condition is that you should be under 35 years old. They, uh, what it provides as, uh, in terms of benefits is again, 100% tuition waiver or, or exemption. That is basically covered by us as a university. And then they provide a monthly stipend to cover living expenses of 1,400 Turkish lira, which can then be used to top up your, um, your coach university funding. They also provide help if you need, for example, a visa to enter Turkey. If you're not, a if you're not able to enter Turkey with a normal tourist um, visa before you, you know, enroll as a student, then they help with that. They also help with, for example, opening a bank account where they deposit your monthly stipend with the flight to, to bring you the first time from your country to Turkey. And also with housing in terms of provide, you know, basically paying Coach University for your housing. Um, they, um, the main, let's say, condition of this scholarship, as I said, is that there is a requirement to learn Turkish by the time you graduate. That's a specific agreement that we have with them. Because our programs are not in Turkish, because they're in English, um, then they have kind of been flexible about that rule in that as long as you show that you are, be, that you're able to speak Turkish to a C1 level by the time you finish your doctoral program in four or five years, then that's fine. That's the main condition you have to, to meet. I have um, written down there the website of this scholarship, turkiebursare.gov.gov.tr. The process to follow is that you apply on their online application system within their deadline period, and then you also apply to our programs in our online application system. Right now, their, I mean, their application deadline is usually the end of February. This year, the deadline was 20th of February, so we have passed that, but that's okay. Um, do not worry, because for the doctoral scholarships, we have a specific agreement with them as Coach University. So as long as you apply on our system, you know, and submit an application to one of our PhD programs, that's okay. And you just need to register as a user on their system. And how it works is if you're offered admission by Coach University, and it mentions that you have been nominated to be one of the Turkish scholarships um, recipients, let's say, we send that list to them, they approve it, and then it's activated on their system and then you can start to receive the benefits that are listed there okay again if you have any questions on how to enter their how to register as a user there um any questions at all about that scholarship you can get in touch with our team and we will you will see our contact details later on and it's also written on our website which i showed earlier which is international.ku.edu.tr okay um, we also, very, I don't want to, to spend too much time on this, but we have also signed specific scholarship agreements with governments or foundations um, or even companies from different countries. So I invite you again to visit our website because uh, let's say, for example, if you're from Kazakhstan or Pakistan or China, um, then we have specific scholarship opportunities. Some of them are more active than others, but we can give you guidance to see if you qualify for any of them. The, the widest one, as I said, is the Turkey Bursleta or Turkish Scholarship Program because all countries are eligible for this um, scholarship. Now, um, just to finish off, if some of you are joining us and you're still um, in your undergraduate degree, in your bachelor's degree, we organize every summer a very nice research program for undergraduate students. 
So again, all countries are eligible. The main criteria is that you should be currently enrolled in university in a bachelor's program. So you shouldn't have graduated already. So you can be in your second, third, even fourth year um, of university. The idea is that you're going to do a research internship with one of our faculty members, including faculty members who are in the Graduate School of Health Sciences. Um, there's no tuition, of course, because it's, it's a research internship and we provide free campus accommodation. The program usually takes place in July and August. You can see the website there. Of course, this year, there's some uncertainty in terms of whether we will be able to um, host students physically on campus. You know, if, if you have to travel from outside of Turkey and join in July, hopefully things might have normalized by then, but they may not. So at this point, we're not able to say if we will go ahead with the program as usual and the application dates have now closed for this year. But if not for you, you may also have some friends who are currently in university who would benefit from taking part in the program next summer. And uh, it's a great opportunity to basically have a taste, you know, kind of like try before you buy of the experience of being a researcher at our university. You would be joining a group um, or a lab in which you can would contribute in a small way to a, an existing project and you get to, you know, meet the professors, meet the other PhD students and master students, see the facilities, not only like of campus, but the, the research facilities. And it's also a good way of seeing if you if you would like living in Istanbul, if you're coming from a very different country in terms of climate, culture, um, etc. So it's a good opportunity for those of you who are perhaps very far away from, from Turkey. So I'm leaving the website here. This is more for information for others or for you if you're still in your undergraduate degree. Okay. Okay. So um, it's been a lot of information and I think now we're getting to the, the uh, interesting part of question and answers. Here you can see, again, the Graduate School of Health Sciences website. That's very important that you visit that and, and look at it in detail, basically, so that you can learn more about the program you're interested in. If you're an international um, participant and you're thinking of applying, you can contact us via email to study at ku.edu.tr. If you're a Turkish applicant, um, we invite you to contact the Graduate School of Health Sciences directly. The email is gshs at ku.edu.tr. Um, and uh, the Graduate School also now has a very nice Instagram uh, channel page. So if you're using Instagram, I invite you right now to just pick up your phone, uh, yeah, your phone <laughs> and start following them. Because again, it's a good chance to, to see what the current students are doing, the faculty members, um, the conferences that they're attending, specific deadlines. So it's a very nice source of information and you can also like their pictures or send messages there. Okay, so that's been a lot of talking from our part. I'm going to now, um, let me just give me one second so I can unmute our panelists. Eje and Simai who are here. Hello Eje and Simai, do you want to- Hello Melissa. Hello guys. Hi, thank you for joining. So um, I think in terms of going through the questions, I've seen that you have typed out some answers. I'm going to first, um, from the ones that I have seen, I will start reading some and asking either you or Professor uh, Yasemin to answer. Okay. So one question was whether there was, that there is an fMRI facility. Actually at the hospital, main hospital, we have the MRI uh, facility uh, used for uh, both clinical uh, uh, studies and also for the daily clinical uh, work, but they have the fMRI, uh, pass, uh, they, you can do the fMRI studies on these uh, MRIs if you can book uh, and if you provide your research and if it is approved. So it is not like just for research, but for both clinical use and the, for the research. Okay, thank you very much. So another question we had, does full tuition waiver applies to all international students? The answer is yes, for our PhD programs. For the master programs, as we said, uh, we do have some master with thesis program that are tuition paying 
Um, but there are limited scholarships for those. And if you are the recipient of one of those scholarships, then yes, you, you can benefit from the full tuition waiver. I think that also answers the question um, that some people uh, asked at the beginning um, of uh, why is there a tuition for the cellular and molecular medicine thesis master program and the neuroscience thesis master program. Um, the neuroscience thesis master program, is a, it's a new program. And as I said, there are limited scholarships for that, but you can also enroll as a tuition paying student. Okay. And we had a question here, can I apply to two PhD programs, for example, immunology and reproductive medicine? And yes, the answer is, yeah. yeah. Of course, you can apply, actually. Uh, the, uh, you can attend to the uh, interviews. And uh, the faculty members are also different for these programs. So if one of the faculty members in a program is interested, maybe two different programs may be interested in you. And then you will decide which one to continue if you are accepted. So you can apply. Okay, good to know. Um, another question we have, my GRE score is below 150, the 156 minimum. There was a similar question. You know, for example, my GRE is 154, but with high GPA, uh, what are my chances? And there's a similar question, for example, here, which is, what, what are the most important requirements in the admissions, like for, for faculty members when they're looking at applicants? So uh, perhaps, Professor Yasemin, if you want to, to give your take on that. Okay, so actually we are uh, mostly looking at the GPAs and also your um, uh, letter stating your interest in which type of study you want to work and also your referees. And then we are also uh, looking to your other requirements, but especially for this year, uh, we will actually, uh, since you will not be able to get the examinations immediately, we will give conditional acceptance if you don't have a GRE or uh, the TOEFL results, uh, and also ALES for Turkish students. So, um, the GPA and your letter of intent is the most important thing uh, for our faculty members. Right, okay. Then I think I have a question for Edge or Simai. One, one person was asking, um, they have already taken the TOEFL, but the score is 79, which is just below the minimum 80. Should they retake it? What would be uh, your advice? Actually, they don't, do not need to take it. Uh, they can apply to our program uh, without their minimum score, but they can uh, bring us the score after the enrollment. Uh, but maybe their uh, success, uh, they will be, be successful in their studies and maybe our executive board will decide to leave their uh, requirements. Okay, all right, thank you. Then we had another question. Um, so the way I understand the question is that uh, you're currently enrolled in another PhD program at another university and you want to apply for transfer from your current PhD program to one of our PhD programs. So um, I guess the question is, is it possible? If yes, how? If not, no. Um, and how do you go about applying? And that if you already have IELTS, then how do you use your IELTS, let's say. The IELTS part, as I said, um, you can apply with your IELTS if you already have it and you know attach it basically to your application. And as Edge just mentioned, again, you will be evaluated and maybe you can be waived from the TOEFL requirement or be asked to bring it during the first semester. Now, is it possible to transfer from another PhD program to our PhD program? So then, yes, it is possible. Uh, they can still apply to our program. Uh, we get a, a applications to our program during the uh, regular application process. Uh, they can apply, yes. Okay. So it's, a, it's the same application form, right? Yes, it is the same. Yes. Okay. Um, then we had a question here. Uh -huh. uh, whether is it is it a you know is it recommended to contact faculty members before applying, 
or having a research proposal approved by a faculty member before applying? Can I ask Professor Yasemin to give her take on that? Um, actually, for contacting the faculty members and discussing their uh, studies, uh, research, and sometimes uh, actually coming to the laboratory of that faculty member and working like one or two months together uh, is uh, strongly advised for, uh, uh, from our point of uh, view because um, so you can see what's going on on that lab and also uh, advisor can uh, talk with you, discuss with you. So um, here the, uh, uh, for the interviews, the most important thing is that you are interested in a faculty member and faculty member must be interested uh, with you. So uh, contacting is very good uh, point, but you are not supposed to provide a research proposal. So you can just uh, know each other, know uh, the faculty member and you know each other better and try to understand each other. Uh, I can strongly recommend that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Yasemin. And that brings back a point about the statement of purpose and why it's so important. Again, the statement of purpose is not supposed to be a full research proposal with, you know, literature review methodology and, and everything. Um, but the idea is that you give a, an idea of what topics you're interested in to see if there are faculty members who are able to supervise you. If you're interested in something that it's very interesting, but nobody's working on at the moment or thinking of working on in the foreseeable future, then again, you know, it means that there's no capacity to, to supervise you. Okay, so we have another question here about the, uh, to just explain a little bit how the molecular biology and, um, and genetics, sorry, molecular biology and engineering program works in terms of how is it structured with the Graduate School of Sciences and Engineering? Uh, okay, again, I can answer this question. Uh, it is like that the faculty members uh, working at the uh, medical side and the graduate under the umbrella of the Graduate School of Health Sciences, they can uh, get their students for, from the molecular uh, biology and genetics <coughs> program. And, uh, but the students become the uh, students of Graduate School of Health Sciences. But if uh, the, uh, from the life sciences part, if a, a professor from the science department recruits the student uh, from the molecular biology and the biology and genetics, then the student becomes a uh, student of the Graduate School of Science and Engineering. So main difference is that there is no other difference. So you can get the uh, necessary lectures together and uh, you can do all the uh, research. Uh, so not much difference. Actually, the uh, research uh, topics and the areas of the advisors may differ. Okay, great. So, um, and, and also just to mention that the, regardless of, uh, you know, for example, if, if uh, which faculty member supervises them, the, the PhD scholarship and benefits would be the same if you're in the Graduate School of Health Sciences or if you're in the Graduate School of Sciences and Engineering. Okay, um, we have a question here about the, uh, the TOEFL, I guess, and GRE, if it's done at home, whether, the ear needs to be visible? That's a very specific question. And unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, so for example, if you're wearing a headscarf, if that's allowed. So that's regarding the specific conditions that you have to uh, meet to have the test at home. What I would advise you is to check the official ETS website because they have a, a list of, you know, what are the, the computer system requirements that you need to have in terms of video, sound, uh, software that you have to install. I'm not sure I have seen an answer to that. So perhaps you might need to uh, send a question to them. Also, I'm sorry that we cannot answer that question right now. Then we have another question about uh, whether uh, there is a certificate in or a certificate PhD in anatomy or physiology, which I guess the answer is no, right? I mean, we're not offering any certificate programs for this 
physiology or the anatomy. Okay, okay. Um, if you're interested in, yeah, because we do have medical specialization programs in, you know, in after a school of medicine, but that's a different, a different thing. Um, then we have a question from someone from North Macedonia asking that if they have completed their um, high school and college education in English, do they still have to take the TOEFL exam? The answer is yes, because North Macedonia is not in the list of the Turkish Higher Education Council as a native English speaking country. I know that it's a bit um, you know, <laughs> frustrating, but that's the rules that we have to abide both for, you know, but for Turkish and also for international candidates. Um, there's a question here of somebody who joined late. If we, they can have the recording of this session, just to repeat that, yes, we will be posting the, the recording of the webinar on our YouTube channel and all the participants who have registered will receive an automatic email tomorrow with the link so that you can watch it anytime you want afterwards and you can share it as well. Okay, we have other questions here. Um, so again, by, back to the TOEFL and GRE test, uh, what if I cannot achieve all the instructions of ETS to do the test at home, how can I be admitted? So as, as we said, there is flexibility this year because we know that you know maybe not everyone has the computer system needed for the at home test for even the funding right now to do that. So do still submit your application with everything else. And as we said, just take the time to prepare your statement of purpose, to get good recommendation letters, to have all of your transcripts ready from your university and apply with that and you will be evaluated on, on that basis. Um, now a question about the transcripts. Um, so um, it says third year physical therapy student and planning to have a diploma to send it before June, but because of coronavirus, uh, we won't, I won't be able to provide it before the shutdown is canceled. Um, is it acceptable to provide just transcripts for my success and provide the diploma until the beginning of the semester? Can Eje or Simai answer that? So, so basically the question is if they can apply without the diploma, just with the transcripts. Yes, they can apply without the diploma, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question from a student here in Turkey who was supposed to graduate in June but due to coronavirus, it has been postponed to September and the thesis is not yet ready. Can I still apply for fall 2020? I think again, it's a question for yes, you guys. Yes, it is yes. Okay, all right. I guess you can indicate in your statement of purpose, what is the topic of your thesis? You know, who is your supervisor? What do you have been doing? What stage are you on? Again, the idea is that you grab the attention of the faculty members so that they're interested to know more you as a candidate uh, and to invite you for, for an interview. Okay. Um, there is another question here. If, if somebody has an acceptance in a PhD program, which is taught in English, does that not certify my application? I guess it's with regards to your English level. So if you're currently if you're currently enrolled in a PhD program which is in English, whether you still need to provide the TOEFL test, I think that's the question. Um, so as, as we said before, you do have to provide a test at some point. There's some flexibility in terms of when. But if the university is not located in an English native speaking country, then no, basically. Um, so there is a question here about our medical microbiology masters or molecular biology and genetics masters. If you have, you know, the, the, the person asking says that they have studied a bachelor's in zoology. Um, is it, I mean, is that a, a degree that it's eligible for this program? And which is most likely considered related according to selection committee? Okay, so first the question about, is that an eligible diploma, zoology? Actually, for our medical microbiology, it is eligible for, I think, for molecular biology and genetics also. So actually, it is like a, a BSc diploma is enough to apply to the programs because our university is uh, actually uh, wants to develop people from different backgrounds 
to provide uh, multi uh, departmental uh, networking and works. So uh, you can apply both programs and depending uh, if, like Melissa said, you have to grab the attention of uh, the faculty members, then you can uh, be involved in the program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then we have a question here. I'm trying to make sense of it. So I guess it's what subjects would be suitable with faculty interest to be accepted in the interview. I think here, as Professor Yasemin was saying, I mean, doing a bit of research before contacting faculty members and before preparing your statement of purpose, uh, it's it's the best strategy basically have a look at their in every faculty member usually has their own website that you can find on Google Scholar ResearchGate Academia or or, or you know the ones hosted on them by themselves and you can see there what they're working on right now uh, some of them even have you know Twitter accounts for their lab groups or Instagram accounts for their labs and it gives you an idea of what subjects they're working on that if you're also interested in, then you can mention that in your statement of, of purpose. I think that's what the question is regarding. Um, there's a question here specifically about Nigeria, um, in which education in Nigeria is offered in English. Are Nigerian citizens needed to write TOEFL examination? Unfortunately, yes, because for the Turkish Higher Education Council, um, Nigeria is not on that list that I was talking about. The same situation, unfortunately, applies, for example, to Pakistan and Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So it means applicants from these countries still need to provide a TOEFL examination with the flexibility that we have already talked about today because of this year's situation. But uh, ultimately, yes. So. Um, Here's an interesting question. If I apply to the PhD program with my biology bachelor's degree, does that mean the evaluation will be much more difficult in terms of test scores, for example? Like, do, do we require higher uh, GRE test scores for someone applying directly from a bachelor's program? Uh, actually, for uh, the Turkish citizens, uh, we are, uh, we just want higher Alice, uh, points uh, for this kind of situation, but maybe I can ask uh, AJ or Sima is that uh, also same uh, for the GRE score? No, it is not the same. Uh, uh, uh, sorry, it is the same. Uh, I mean, like they do not, do not need to provide higher score. It is the same. So the time is spent in the PhD program is longer and they have to take more uh, lectures compared to the uh, direct PhD program. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have a question here uh, from, uh, so if we get admission to a master's program during the education, can we upgrade it to PhD level in, if you know, you meet the conditions for the PhD? Yes, of course they can upgrade, but uh, actually if the uh, applicant is suitable for the PhD program at the beginning, if uh, he or she applied to the master's program, uh, at the interviews we most of the time recommend them to directly pass to the PhD program, but that's also the other way is also possible. Okay, um, then we have a question here. Uh, about the master degree admission, how the interview is being set, what should we have in mind in order to, to be successful at it? So how is the interview arranged? I will ask Eje and Simai to just, you know, briefly describe how, how candidates are contacted, how many, how many days in advance, how long is the interview? Um, Professor Yasemin, if you can talk about, you know, what are you looking for during the interviews? What, you know, what, yeah, what are you looking for during that time? Who will start first? Me or Jessimai? Actually, I can start. Uh, during the interview, actually, we are trying to understand if the uh, student is really eager to do the science and to work in that subject. So we are just looking at the uh, capacity of the research or the knowledge of the person in that field. And it's like, you, we just try to sense if that student is suitable for that 
program. Okay. And in terms of the format of the interview, how you contact interview uh, the shortlisted candidates, can AJ or Simai answer that, please? Uh, we are going to contact with uh, by email with them uh, and we are organizing in online interviews uh, because of the coronavirus. Um, at the end of the, uh, June, uh, the applications is uh, going to close. I mean, it's 26 uh, June, uh, as far as I, I remember. And uh, we are going to contact with them, uh, the eligible applicants uh, is called and uh, it's called for the uh, online interviews, uh, but the, um, the exact date, it's not clear yet, I, I guess, uh, I don't remember, hold me check. Maybe it's going to be on uh, July 13. I mean, okay. so all, all interviews are set up for one day with the shortlisted, but the yes. eligible Okay. Yes, one day, yes. And usually the interview lasts for how long? Like half an hour, one hour, hour and a half? Like just, just, for, uh, just for one applicant, it's around uh, 25 minutes. Okay. And is the interview with one faculty member or more than one faculty member? No, with the committee, actually. Mm -hmm. The first step uh, with the committee. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then uh, we have a question here. Which of the courses offering your faculty align with forensic medicine? Actually, I gave the answer. Okay. It is like we don't have the uh, any faculty member working on the forensic medicine. The School of Medicine has one uh, professor working on forensic medicine, but He's not involved in our graduate program, so we don't provide that subject, sorry. Okay. Um, this is a question that was asked before, but just to repeat it, it might be helpful for other participants. Does contacting a potential supervisor before applying give you a better chance of acceptance? So yes, I think, of course. Yeah, exactly. So yes, um, just, I, I always say, just keep in mind that our professors are extremely busy people that get a lot of emails. So, you know, my personal advice, looking at, you know, at, at how people are responded to or not, is just keep it short, grab their attention, make sure you include your CV and that you outline very briefly what are you interested in and what program you're thinking of applying to so that they can answer you um, quickly. You know, like three page emails are, you know, <laughs> it's very hard for, I think, for faculty members to be reading that and responding back to you quickly as well. Um, there is a question here. What is the extra advantage of a master thesis over master without thesis after graduation? So well, I question. can answer this question. Uh, with master of thesis, for example, if you want to continue with the PhD program or become a, a faculty member or researcher in that area, you, it is better for you to take the a master with thesis, because during the thesis period, you will uh, get the necessary qualifications for this research uh, topic, and uh, it would make you better candidate for the PhD applications. Uh, but if you just want to uh, improve your knowledge and the, uh, to get some uh, more information or the need uh, data about your subject and if you are working or if you want to get a kind of promotion with the uh, master degree, it is recommended to continue with uh, master uh, without thesis. So main difference is the way you will follow in the future. Exactly, like depending on your career goals and whether you are more inclined towards academia and research or more towards um, uh, you know, industry, let's say. So I think an example that we have seen is with the reproductive biology program, um, because some, some applicants are interested, for example, in setting up their own um, assisted reproductive medicine and, and facilities type 
uh, clinics in their country. So they're interested in this type of master without thesis program to advance their careers. But we don't have many students yet in that, let's say in that regard, but that's that could be an example. And we have another question here. Um, uh, to, uh, sorry, just trying to read the, the question to summarize it. So if, so if there's scholarship opportunities for the master with thesis in cellular and molecular medicine, if you can't afford to pay the tuition fees, and should I state that I can't afford the tuition fees in the last paragraph of my statement of purpose? So as we said, yes, there are limited scholarships for that master program. And if you're not able to afford the tuition fees, yes, mention that in your statement of purpose, but just make sure that everything else in your application in terms of your academic uh, performance so far and, and potential, it's very clear to the, to the evaluators. Um, then we have a question here for the molecular biology and genetics program. Should we apply to this program if we already applied? Ah, okay. So um, if they have already submitted an application for the molecular biology and genetics in this, the graduate school of sciences and engineering, should they also apply um, again for the same program in the graduate school of health sciences? No, actually they don't need because uh, the uh, uh, applications go through the graduate school of science for the MBG program. But if they are not uh, accepted or called, they can apply to our cellular and molecular medicine program, which is very similar. And the same faculty members are taking also uh, the students from uh, cellular molecular medicine, as well as from the GSSC, uh, molecular biology and uh, genetics program. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. There's a a question here for you, Professor Yasemin, uh, which is a candidate who says um, they're interested in doing research on protein engineering, especially in STING, S-T-I-N-G, protein. Uh, which professor, or if you have any recommendation um, that their background is a master's in biotechnology and bachelor's in medical laboratory science. So it's specifically if you know any of our faculty members who might be working on STING protein. Actually, I don't know anyone, uh, especially in the sting protein, but Nurhan Özlü from the science uh, faculty working on the proteins. So mm -hmm. uh, you may just look at the Nurhan Özlü's website, try to mm -hmm. understand if it's suitable for you. And okay. I don't know other people. So um, to find Professor Nurhan, uh, you can visit our uh, our science, uh, our College of Science website, it's science, as it's written, .ku.edu.tr. You will see the list of faculty members on their molecular biology and genetics, and you will see her listed. You will see all of the professors there, um, and you will find her profile there as well. Um, there is a question here. If, if you're not selected by COACH, is there an option of joining COACH by paying tuition fees or self-funding? if a prospective student is so keen on joining the university? So, I, I mean, I think the answer is, um, you do have to be accepted by coach. Um, I mean, you need to meet the, the, the academic uh, admission requirements. Yeah, of course, the academic admission requirements. But if the, uh, I think uh, he's asking about like, funding is limited, so we will take the best students and if he wants to be uh, involved in the program with the tuition paying, uh, although he, uh, because he provides the enrollment requirements, I think, if I understand wrong, um, then he can apply. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there is a question here uh, that I think might be in, in a lot of people's mind as well. How is it guaranteed that PhD program will start in fall 2020? I mean, uh, if in, in September 2020, commencing, commencing the semester has been, def, it's, it's definite or not, according to the COVID-19 situation. So unfortunately, the answer is we don't know yet. So we have to wait for what the Higher Education Council of Turkey will say to all universities, not only coach, but to all universities in the coming months on whether we uh, will be allowed 
to open back our campus uh, for all activities in September 2020 or not, or if it is going to be on a partial basis to allow only for research and specific lectures and some lectures are going to be online. All of that, unfortunately, right now, it's a question mark for us as well. Our advice is to just, you know, make sure that you keep uh, visiting our website regularly, you know, like once a month, I would say in the next few months, because if there's any updates, uh, we will publish them there, either on the graduate school uh, of health sciences website or in our international admissions website. We also have a specific uh, COVID-19 page where we put announcements from our president in terms of any changes to teaching or you know campus access or anything like that so just keeping an eye on that is the only thing we can do for now as soon as we know for certain then we will announce it both to our current students and also to admitted students who will start in fall 2020. then we have a question here um, and i'm also mindful of the time we have we are now at 6 30. If Professor Yasemin Agents in mind don't mind staying for maybe five more minutes to answer. There's so many questions and it's so nice to see all of these questions. So I'll As just you know, yes. you know. Of course. Yeah, I can continue. Okay, okay. So there is a question here. What are the career opportunities after graduation from molecular biology and genetics? reproductive biology, cellular and molecular medicine masters other than academia. So what I guess the question is what kind of um, industry can graduates work in that are not universities? Yeah, actually this is a, a hot question for the last years because there are a lot of uh, people graduating from this uh, health sciences PhD and master programs and they are not actually, there is very limited offer for the being at the faculty uh, positions. So um, actually uh, drug companies and uh, industries working on the, like today's, for example, more popular thing like COVID. We have seen that the ventilator companies and uh, some other drug companies. So a kind of uh, companies having the uh, our, uh, research and development department, or you can go through the uh, business using your knowledge, uh, putting, uh, for example, the your information knowledge to the sales, for example. So you have to be creative. For example, uh, one of my PhD students uh, gr graduated from the neuroscience PhD and went to the USA due to her husband's work. And now uh, she is uh, doing this scientific illustration because she has the ability to do uh, very good illustrations and with the knowledge of the neuroscience, now she can uh, easily do the scientific illustrations. So it's a kind of, you have to think uh, white about the uh, subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think as a, in Turkey specifically, um, there are several companies that have R&D departments, as you, as you mentioned, in big pharma, in terms of drug, the drug development, drug delivery, um, and also to, to an extent, for example, organizations that have to do with, uh, now that we have a master's and a um, PhD in immunology, for example, organizations that have to plan around public health policy, uh, at international or national level could also be employers of our of our graduates. And as you said, yes, there, there's limited actually opportunities in academia itself because it's, it's a very narrow field. Um, there's a question here. Is there any running research in computational neuroscience? I think that's a question for you, Professor Yasemin. Yeah, actually, as uh, I know, uh, in, not under the Graduate School of Health Sciences, but from the uh, engineering faculty, uh, you can look at the, and all may also may contact with the, uh, the dean of the engineering faculty, Özgür Barış Akan. Actually, he is doing the computational neuroscience. So uh, you can get the information from mm -hmm. him. And since our programs are very uh, intersected, so uh, we are doing the research also together. 
Okay, so for Professor Osgur Barish account to find his profile, you can visit our uh, engineering college website, which is eng, like eng for engineering, dot ku, dot edu, dot tr. You will find him in the faculty section for electrical and electronics engineering. He's also the director of the Graduate School of Sciences and Engineering. So you can also find his profile there. And you can see his lab and, and everything else. Um, there's a thank you here to me. So thank you <laughs> for another webinar we did on how to write the statement of purpose. Thank you um, to the person who wrote that. Then um, again, just to say that you will be able to get a recording of the meeting after today, we will post it to our YouTube channel and you will be able to watch it afterwards. If you have registered for the webinar, you will receive it automatically a day after, you know, like tomorrow basically. And you can click on the link to watch it and share it as you wish. Then um, a question here, which is, I have a, uh, whoops, sorry, lost the question now. Uh, I'm, I so, I'm sorry, I have answered that means. <laughs> ah, okay. So yeah, it was a question about uh, if I have a master's in immunology and clinical microbiology, if they can join as a PhD student. So I guess the answer is yes. Yeah, it's, it's an eligible academic background. Um, so it says regarding the self-funding option, how do I indicate in my application that I would be interested in self-funding in the case of limited funding? And do I wait for admission decision before indicating or indicate my intention to self-fund at the first instance of applying? So, Actually, uh, for John, I can say that he can apply to Turkish scholarships. So uh, if he applies to Turkish scholarships, I think if uh, he's accepted, he will get the fund. Uh, so no worry about that, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about this condition, Melissa? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's good advice. Um, if you want to indicate somewhere that you do have some funding to cover your tuition, um, I think the logical place would be the statement of purpose. Maybe not right at the beginning, but just to mention in, uh, somewhere in the statement of purpose that you, you are able to self-fund part of your tuition costs, if you want to say it somewhere. Uh, but again, this doesn't, I mean, this doesn't influence the decision whether to accept a student or not, as Professor Yasemin was saying. There's a question on the chat, and I think that's the last one we have for today, uh, which is, if you have a bachelor's degree in dental surgery, can I apply for the PhD in human physiology without master's? Uh, well, we don't have a PhD in human physiology. We have a master's in medical physiology. So I guess the question is if you can apply having done dental surgery. Yes, of course. We don't put limitations for the applications. Mm -hmm. So he or she can apply. Okay. So I think we should be wrapping up now. If there's no other questions. Oh, okay. There's one question here. Is there any age limit for scholarships if someone is applying for the master's program? For Koch University, we don't have age limits for, for admission or for scholarships. Um, for the Turkish scholarships, for the PhD scholarships, they do have an age limit of 35 years old. And for the master programs, uh, because they also have master scholarships, there is an age limit, which unfortunately I can't remember right now top of my head, but I think it's um, 27 years old, but I can double check. And you can also find information on their website if, if you're referring to the Turkish scholarships. For Koch University, in terms of our admissions, we don't have any type of limitations by age, you know, in terms of, you know, how old or under how many years you have to be to apply for a master's program. Okay, so I think it has been a really, really uh, useful webinar for everyone involved. I hope and thank you again so much for everyone who joined today. Um, we look forward to receiving your applications before the deadline. And I think uh, our colleagues, Edie and Simai have answered also some questions directly to you. And you can, as, as I said, contact us via email. Uh, make sure you follow their Instagram channel and you can send questions there as well. Um, so that's all for me. Thank you so much for joining. If you want to say bye, Professor Yasemin, Edie and Simai. 
Thank you, Thank you for everything. Thank you very much for listening and discussing with us. Uh, that was really a very good opportunity for us also to introduce ourselves and our programs to you. I hope we will see you at the, our interviews. Great. Okay. Yeah. So that's all for now. We're going to end the meeting and, we look, and you can look forward to receiving the recording tomorrow via email. So thank you, everyone. Stay safe and healthy wherever you are. And uh, let's keep in touch. Okay. Bye. Bye.